trial day seven back in session. Braggs Pecker back on the stand. We're going to jump into the trial testimony, courtesy of Inner City Press, Matthew Russell Lee reporting, links in the description below to his work. But before we do, Donald Trump showed up in New York and he had a little bit to say before the day's proceedings occurred. And you'll see here, we have it fast forwarded a little bit because Trump came out and he said, you know, one of the first things I noticed today when we were arriving to this rigged show trial is that the economy doesn't look so good. GDP numbers came out a little bit lower than everybody was expecting, causing some concern, a little bit of panic out there as people realize what's happening with their country. They just keep spending and spending and spending. So Trump gave us a little introduction there, and then he just gives us a little bit of a summation before he turns around, walks in, takes a couple questions, and we'll dive into the testimony right after we get the scene set by the president. And here's some audio. My constitutional rights have been taken away from me, but every single expert, every legal scholar, every respected scholar has said this is no case. There is no case here. This is just a political witch hunt. Thank you very much. Are you feeling about the Supreme Court argument in the trial? Are you ready to be missing the argument today? I think that the Supreme Court has a very important argument before it today. I would have loved to have been there, but this judge would not allow that to happen. I should be there. But he wouldn't allow it to happen. I think he puts himself above the Supreme Court. He certainly does. Which is unfortunate, isn't it? But the argument on immunity is very important. The president has to have immunity. This has nothing to do with me. This has to do with a president in the future for 100 years from now. If you don't have immunity, as a country. you're not going to do anything. You're going to become a ceremonial president. You're just going to be doing nothing. You're not going to take any of the risks, both good and bad. I mean, you're going to make some great decisions and save the country. You're going to make some decisions which are unfortunate, but that's the way it is. But you're not going to do anything if you don't have immunity, because otherwise you're going to be prosecuted after you leave office or doing something like going into an area, going into a country, doing lots of things that you wouldn't be doing. And we don't want a ceremonial president. We have to have a real president. And assuming you have the right person, that can make a big difference. You saw that for four years when I was president. We were respected all over the world. We had the best economy we've ever had. Everything was good. We had no wars. We defeated ISIS. We had no wars. We had no nothing. But we were respected all over the world. And now it's a it's a disgrace. We also, by the way, had the single best border ever in recorded history of our country. We had the best border ever. And now it's a disaster through and through, top to bottom. Joe Biden is a failure. All right, let's jump into the trial testimony. And to do so, we jump over to Inner City Press. You know who he is. Matthew Russell Lee reporting. We're back in session. Trump has arrived. He's sitting at the defense table whispering into the ear of his lawyer, Emil Bo. Pool photographers come into the courtroom. Donald Trump stands there seated, looking good. Blue suit, red tie today. We're waiting for Judge Mercon. Where the heck is he? Clock is 9.34. He said 9.30, he's late. Boom, the door swings open. Clark comes in and announces, all rise. Ruff. Please be seated. She sits back, she says, this is the time set for People versus Donald Trump in number whatever. Judge Mercon starts the day off. Good morning, everybody. Mr. Bove, would you like to go over what we discussed yesterday. He says, oh, certainly, Your Honor, good morning. We received Your Honor's email. This is Trump's defense attorney. We got Your Honor's email about embedded hearsay, and we conferred with the government, as you thought, and yeah, it was helpful for us. And so to recap what happened here, remember, the government's trying to get in a bunch of documents and a bunch of evidence that the defense says, wait a minute, that evidence that you're trying to admit has statements inside of it that are hearsay, that are out-of-court statements that are being offered for the truth of the matter being asserted here that Trump is a criminal. And so we can't have that admitted into those documents. So there's portions of the documents that are problematic. So the judge says, what did you do about that? He says, well, yeah, we did. We went and conferred with the government about some of this hearsay in their documents, and that was helpful. So I think we've got some of these issues ironed out. In other words, when the government admits this as evidence, we're not going to object to it because the hearsay has been redacted. We've agreed to pull stuff out, whatever. Government says, Steinglass, Your Honor, I think we're ready. I think we can start with the jury. In the first two hours, there's only one document that I might try to get in that's even disputed. So we'll just deal with that when it comes up. So I think we can get going. And Trump's defense says on that one that he's talking about too, Your Honor, our position is that a redaction is going to be necessary. So we'll just, if we redact it, we're fine with that. Just put a redaction on it. No problem. Judge says, all right, all right, we'll deal with that in the break. Are we ready for the jury then? Government says, no, nope. we also have one other issue we want to bring to your attention, Judge. And of course we covered this back in day six when Trump came out and had a conversation with the media. He mentioned Michael Cohen. We played the clip. Uh-oh, we said there's another one. And boom, here they are. So Prosecutor Conroy stands in. Your Honor, we 
have another order to show cause, Your Honor. And he has a thumb drive. He's waving it around. We have video clips, including of what Trump said just outside this courtroom in his press conferences or whatever they are, his speech to the media. He said, Cohen got caught lying. He said, when are they going to come look at that? When Cohen was lying. Remember when that federal judge said he was a serial perjurer in federal document? Says, Trump said that the judge, that's you, Your Honor, looking at him, picked the jury so quickly that it's now 95% Democrats. And then in an interview on a Pennsylvania TV station, again, we played that one yesterday, he said, David Pecker, I don't know exactly what he'll be testifying about. He's talking about witnesses. So, Your Honor, he's violating this again. And this morning, Trump did a press event on 49th Street and Park Avenue. And he told the media there, they're like, you know, scouring this dude. He said, David Pecker's a nice guy. And this is just before his testimony. And so it's a message to him and to other witnesses, you know, be nice or else Trump will be coming for you. And so, Your Honor, we ask that you right now find him in contempt. So Trump, you know, allegedly violated three more times, another $3,000 when they come back tomorrow for another contempt hearing, which the judge has scheduled. So the judge says, all right, all right, we'll deal with it. Thanks for bringing it to my attention. We'll handle it. All right, let's get going. He says, please bring in the witness. And Mr. David Pecker comes walking into the courtroom. He's there back on the bench. Judge says, Mr. Pecker, I remind you, you're still under oath. Yeah, okay, thanks, judge. All right, bring in the jury. Jury enters. Everyone stands. Oh, hi, jury. Good morning. Thanks for hearing. We love you. Come in. Government prosecutor stands back up. David Pecker's on the stand. Government says, all right, Mr. Pecker, let's resume on Miss McDougal. Of course, we know Miss McDougal is the former playmate who was on the cover a bunch. And I think playmate of the year, maybe December playmate of the month. And you remember what she looks like. Hard to miss. He says, yeah, well, okay. What do you want to know about her? Let me tell you. She was 47 years old and she said that she had a sexual relationship with Mr. Trump. Says, wow, really? How'd you learn about this? Careful. Did you have a three-way call with Dylan Howard and Michael Cohen that day? Mr. Pecker? He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy with the three-way stuff, okay? We got on a phone call, all right? That's all. Dylan Howard, Michael Cohen. He says, yeah, immediately. Michael Cohen told me it's not true. Okay, so someone called. There was a phone call. Dylan Howard, which I believe was another lawyer. Michael Cohen, they get on the call. Cohen says, it's not true. They said, but that's, you know, that's something that Cohen always said. And so then Cohen said, all right, I'll check it out and I'll get back to you. And so Michael Cohen looked into it. Is that right? Yeah. And when Michael Cohen came back, did he tell you to buy the story? Pecker says, yeah, he did. Dylan said that there was another person who wanted to buy the story also. So they're shopping this around. You know, Dylan said ABC wanted to buy the story too. In fact, they offered her, McDougal, a slot on Dancing with the Stars. Hey, bring us this Trump dirt and we'll put you on TV. That'll be great. You can just swing those things around. And a Mexican group wanted to buy it for a million dollars. A million dollars for this story about an affair. So, you know, the Mexicans were like, oh gosh, she's going to build a wall. We'll pay a million. What do you want? So Pecker's explaining. He says, Dylan said McDougal didn't want to be the next Monica Lewinsky. We know what happened there. But she wanted to restart her career. This is David Pecker on the stand. Of course she did. And she'd had a cover with us and Dylan said she'd like to bring the story to us, American media. And so her attorney was Keith Davidson. And so when they came to us, I thought we should buy it. And you had a conversation with Donald Trump about this? That's a good question, right? Wow, okay, this could be implicating Donald Trump with some criminality, right? Wrong. There's no criminality here charged in the indictment at all. All of these allegations, as far as we know thus far, are for Stormy Daniels, okay? It's from Michael Cohen to Stormy. And the bills evidently are from Cohen to Trump, felony. Trump enters a ledger, felony two, cuts a check, felony three. All for Stormy. So they're not even alleging a crime here, right? But they're just smearing the jury with all this. Like none of this should even be in here. So you had a conversation with Trump about this? Yeah, we did. I was at an investor's meeting in New Jersey, says David Pecker. The assistant said, there's a call from you from Donald Trump. He's like, you're kidding for me? Okay. So I took the call. Mr. Trump said to me, Trump said, I spoke to Michael. Karen's a nice girl. And he asked, hey, Mr. Pecker, is there a Mexican group out there that's really going to buy this woman's story for $8 million? That's Trump. Pecker says, I said no, but I thought that we should buy the story anyways. He's like, no. He's like, I checked into it. The Mexicans don't want it for $8 million. Maybe a million, but not eight. But I think we should buy it. Government says, okay. So you're saying that Trump called Miss McDougal a nice girl. Is that what you said? He says, yeah, I believe he knew who she was. And Pecker says, Mr. Trump told me right then. He says, I don't buy stories because it always gets out anyways. Prosecution cuts him off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did Michael Cohen then call you though? Yeah, he did the next day. He said, you know, you should go ahead and buy that story, David. I said, okay, I'll have Dylan Howard negotiate that, another lawyer. And who's going to pay for it? Cohen told me the boss will take care of it. And who do you understand the boss to be, Mr. Pecker? Donald Trump. And 
I told Dylan Howard to go negotiate to buy the story. And did you discuss the terms? We did. It was $150,000 for lifetime rights. She also wanted to appear in our magazine. She had a problem with her breast implants. Oh, uh oh. And wanted to write about it in Shape Magazine. And she wanted to anchor red carpet events for Radar. Yeah, she had a droopy booby problem. And so she needed to fight for justice and explain how predatory and probably patriarchal the industry is as she's inflating her chest with hot air balloons. So she is creating her career, writing this whole story to get back on track. Okay, now how often did you speak with Michael Cohen? Daily, says Pecker. I told Michael Cohen, I said, why should I pay for this? I just paid $30,000 for the doorman story. And who's gonna reimburse me for $150,000, says Pecker. And what did Cohen say? Well, he said the boss will take care of it. Government says, I'd like to introduce People's Exhibit 173. You recognize this? Start with page one. These are marked for the government texts with Dylan Howard. You recognize these? He says, yeah, I do. They're texts. Okay. And here on this page, Dylan Howard texted that he'd spoken with MC about the other issue. What do you understand that to mean? Texted. Dylan said, I'd spoken with MC, presumably Michael Cohen, about that other issue. What did you understand that to mean? Pecker says, what? Can you clarify what you're asking? He says, well, I can't testify, but was there a contract signed with Karen McDougal, Droopy Booby McDougal? Yes, the first week of August 2016, we signed it. Were you concerned about buying a story when you bought this from her? Pecker says, yeah, I did. I bought a story before for Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was buying Flex, and I was told I had to meet Arnold, who said he wanted our tabloids not to run anything against me, is what he said. Why? He was running for governor. Oh, I wonder if they indicted him for that. Hmm. Did Governor Schwarzenegger put in there in his billing records something more lawful? And if so, what was that? Or did his lawyers sign these NDAs like everybody does? Hmm. Arnold, and you know what's so funny about this? It's like, has Arnold ever come to the defense of Trump for this stuff? Ever stood up and said, this is ridiculous. This prosecution is ridiculous. Okay, this is obviously a joke. We do this stuff all the time. In fact, here he says, there were women selling stories about relationships with Arnold or sexual harassment by him. So I would just buy them up. I'd just go buy those stories up. But one, we didn't buy and she sold it to the LA Times. And so it was very embarrassing for me because I couldn't get it. And I was trying to, you know, protect him basically. He says, so it was very, very embarrassing for me when it happened. And so I became sensitive about buying stories in the future. Okay, so he's done this whole thing for Arnold. And Arnold's a politician who comes out and bashes Trump as being a, you know, criminal or democracy, blah, blah, blah. This is lawfare. This is a double standard of justice. Maybe Arnold should say, I should be prosecuted too for this, right? Equal justice, right? So what did you take away from this, says the prosecutor? Pecker says, I wanted to be comfortable with that agreement with Karen McDougal. I met all the obligations with respect to a campaign contributions. I wanted to make sure I was lawyered up. So I told Michael Cohen that we consulted with a campaign lawyer. Oh, great. So he went to go get a lawyer to help him through this. Government says, okay, great. I'd like to introduce People's 156. You recognize this? He says, yeah, I do. That's the Karen McDougal contract that we executed with her. It says, I wanted to substantiate the $150,000 payment with the campaign finance laws that the money was for services to AMI, which of course you could imagine anything, right? They're gonna put her on a magazine. They're gonna put her in these stories and all this stuff. Okay, we'll pay you for your image, your likeness for your, you know, for those two things, put those on the cover or whatever. We'll sell a bunch of magazines with those. So, all right, we'll pay you 150 grand, no problem. Were the provisions about work for AMI meant to disguise the payment for the life rights to the story? He says, uh, I don't know what you mean. I guess, yes. Like they didn't put in the job description on the invoice, cover up sexual relationship allegations with Donald Trump invoice, 150,000. Like they didn't put that in there, right? They said, you're gonna be quiet with this allegation. We're gonna give you some stuff in exchange for this contractual agreement. And you're going to honor your end, we'll honor our end. There's an exchange there, consideration in the term. So do you have any intention of publishing the story, Mr. Pecker? He says, no, I did not, no. Now, who was aware about this on the Trump side? Pecker says, Michael Cohen, period. See that right there? Ooh. Who was aware on the Trump side? Michael Cohen. Government says, uh-oh. Well, what about Donald Trump? Trump's lawyer says, objection, leading. He's trying to give an answer. Judge sustains that because it's clearly leading. Oh, uh, did Trump do it? Government botched that one. Should have said, anyone else? Was there anyone directing Michael Cohen? You know, whatever. Objection, can't just call out Trump sustained of course prosecutor moves on says okay well what about AMI's general ledger and this invoice because remember Trump got charged with a felony every time there was an entry entered and every time there was an invoice sent by Michael Cohen so Pecker says 
well, here's what we did. This one was from Keith Davidson. So we did the same thing. It was from Keith Davidson. We wired 150 grand into his escrow account. Okay, and is this the payment voucher? He looks at it, he says, yeah. And were you aware of the coordinated contributions? Objection! Trump's lawyer, Mercon says, what's going on? They come up to the bench. Mercon sends him back. Objections overruled. Government says, were you aware of the coordinated contributions that were made in coordination? Were you aware that those are unlawful? He says, did you report that to the FEC? He says, no, we did not. So why did AMI make this purchase? He says, so it wouldn't run the story, obviously. But why though? Well, we didn't want it to embarrass Mr. Trump or the campaign. He says, oh, we? Who is we? He says it again. Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen did. Period. He's trying to get him to say Cohen and Trump and someone else. He's not. Cohen did it. Okay, so it stops with Cohen, the lawyer, to the president. Did you walk about Mr. Trump or did you talk about Mr. Trump, though, actually acquiring the right to the story? So not did you talk to Trump, but did you talk about Trump ultimately becoming the owner of the rights? He says, yeah, Cohen and I, Cohen said that I should just assign the contract to him. But he said, Michael Cohen called me constantly. Okay, guy was annoying as hell, obviously, still is. He called me all the time. Like he wanted to get all the files, the boxes from Florida and all the things. Did he say why Trump wanted the boxes? He said, well, yeah, you know, you never know what could happen to David Pecker. He says, man, if I got hit by a bus or something or the company's acquired or something, he didn't want the materials being published. So like we bought them, oh, we should go get them. Now I told Michael Cohen, says Pecker, what Karen McDougal was going to do for us, I valued at $25,000, right? So I would sell the lifetime rights for $125,000. And Michael Cohen said, that's great. We can do that, no problem. 125 grand, she'll take it. And it just makes it seem like much more of a fake story. Like if the Mexicans will give her a million for it, why didn't she take that? I don't know. So he's like, okay, it's probably not a real story. This is all that I can get. Here you go. And I'll take it. Now, he's also going to be getting a benefit from this. Like 25 grand, maybe per year, right? She's going to be on cover of magazines, writing articles and stuff. And so he'll get to monetize her likeness and her celebrity. And he's going to be buying a story. So it's not like this is money going into the bottom of a barrel. He's going to be leveraging this transaction and also getting some favor with Trump for saying this woman was going to say something bad and we've silenced that and given her what she really wants is just attention. So they say, okay, here's the invoice. People's 161. It's an invoice. He shows him. Pecker says, this is from a company owned by Daniel Rothstein. He lives in a plantation, Florida. He would write a check for us, for example, for paparazzi photographers. And so I wanted the Trump organization check to go through him. And so Michael Cohen created Resolution Consultants and they say, okay, I move to admit it, whatever. He says, okay, jurors, look, listen, this is not offered for the truth of the matter, only to show you that there was an invoice that existed. The government says, well, can you give us a shorter answer? Why did you use Daniel Rothstein? He says, I didn't want a payment in AMI from Trump or from Michael Cohen. I didn't want it coming from them. Why not? He says, well, other editors would find out about it and I didn't want that to happen. What was the name of Daniel Rothstein's company? He says, hey, it was called Investor Advisory Services Inc. And I assume Michael Cohen was being reimbursed. So then I decided to reverse it. Michael Cohen said, you know, the boss is going to be very upset with you if you don't go through with this or something. And I told him, I said, I'm not going forward. Did AMI ever get reimbursed for that? Pecker says, no. Government says, okay, let's take a break here, judge. They do. 20 minutes go by, we fast forward. Mercon's back on the bench. Jury is not in yet. Judge says, okay, now this document in which AMI's general counsel released Sajudin, who's the doorman, the doorman claimed that he had a story about Trump having a kid with someone. You may need another witness to bring it into evidence. Trump's lawyer says, well, the next one is from Dylan Howard, who is also not testifying. And so that name should be redacted. So please redact it. And the judge says, yeah, I agree. There are details that could be redacted. And so the government says, okay, we'll send around some proposed redactions and we'll take a look at it. Now, jury's still not in. Trump's lawyer says, okay, and this is a text message between Dylan Howard and somebody. Government says, whoa, watch it, buddy. Emil Bove says, I'm sorry, sorry. Didn't mean to say that out loud. I didn't mean to mention a name. Don't know who that is. Dylan Howard and somebody. It's a first, prosecutor says, it's a first degree relative of Mr. Howard, but it was on an AMI device. So you're saying they're business records? Government says, I'm saying they're authenticated. So yeah. And says, Dylan Howard texted his relative. Candidate denies this, but I'm going to interview. Relative, why are you going if you're not going to publish it? Dylan wrote, information is powerful and I'm collecting a lot. Only DP knows burner phones. So we think, says the prosecutor, all of that shows Dylan Howard's state of mind. Then there are the election night texts where Dylan Howard texted his relative, says, at least if he wins, I'll be pardoned for electoral fraud. Mercon says, I will consider this again over lunch, but that they come off an AMI device is not enough for me. Are we going to be done with Mr. Pecker 
today. Are we gonna be done with both direct and cross? Government says, I don't know. I have a good two to three hours left. Trump's lawyer says, we're not gonna finish today, Judge. Judge says, Ugh. all right, let's get the witness and the jury back. Mr. Pecker, you remain under oath. Jury comes back in, all rise. Right. Prosecutor, back with Pecker. Mr. Pecker, after the election, you released Dino Sajudin. That's the doorman. And they gave the doorman like 30 grand because he said he had a story about some affair. Pecker says, yeah, we released him. That was December, 2016. And the Access Hollywood tape? Oh yeah, I remember that. That was a conversation between Mr. Trump and Billy Bush. Mr. Trump said, you can grab a woman by the purse and it was damaging for the campaign. We all remember that. Government says, well, what's this email? Do you remember this? He says, yeah, it's about a post on radar. He says, you can take it down. He says, no, please read it. It says, Howard wrote to Michael Cohen that the Playboy man story was on radar before we bought the site. And it was also sent to Hope Hicks. Hope Hicks works for Trump. Did you ever email with Donald Trump, Mr. Pecker? No. Okay. Well, I want to turn your attention to another matter here. When did you first hear about Stormy Daniels, Mr. Pecker? He says, well, which is actually the charged conduct related to her NDA and payments. When did you hear about Stormy Daniels, Mr. Pecker? Well, I was having dinner with my wife and I got a call from Dylan Howard. He said, Keith Davidson and Miss Rodriguez, an agent for those type of celebrities, you know, those types, that Stormy was selling a story about sex with Trump. Can you read me your text with Dylan Howard? He says, yeah, he wrote to me. He said, okay, they sent me a text. They said the price is 120,000. And there's also interest from the Daily Mail or Mail and from GMA. And I responded, I said, I don't want AMI linked to some porn star, disgusting. It would be bad with Walmart, our biggest distributor. So we don't want that story. And I told him, I said, look, we already paid the doorman $30,000 and $150,000 to McDougal. I'm not a bank. So Dylan Howard contacted Michael Cohen, right? He's chopping the story around. Okay, you don't want to buy it. Who else? And I spoke with Michael too. And Michael said, can you just pay for the story? I said, no, I'm not going to be involved with some porn star. Get out of here. Pecker says, so Dylan came to my office near the end of October then. Michael Cohen was supposed to wire the money to Keith Davidson, but he didn't. Dylan was worried that he'd lose the sources. And so Michael Cohen says, David, you should pay. I said, no, you buy it or the boss will be angry. The government says, is there a record of your interview with the FBI? He says, yeah. Is this it? Yeah. I want to show you this 302B. Uh, go to page five here. Why did you make calls on Signal, the private messaging app? Pecker says, well, Michael Cohen said to use it. He says things are deleted after a time. And did there ever come a time that Keith Schiller told you that Karen McDougal was going on ABC, who may have also wanted the story? Yes, says Pecker. I checked with Dylan Howard, who said, it's not true. I told Keith and he said, the boss is very pleased. But then the journal was calling our spokesperson and Trump was very mad. Okay, he had told me that it must have been us that were leaking the story, so the story got out anyways. I said, no, Mr. Trump, it's not us. I said, it must have been Karen McDougal. But Mr. Trump was agitated and our call ended pretty abruptly. Oh no, what do you mean abruptly? Well, Trump didn't say goodbye, which was very rare. I think it's important to say goodbye, you know. Sometimes you're mad, it happens. Why did you put out a statement that AMI does not pay to kill stories, Mr. Pecker? He says, I wanted to protect my company and myself and Trump. I asked Dylan to call Keith Davidson, who said that Karen McDougal was in Arizona, not taking calls. And Karen has another lawyer approach us. And so they came and they were asking about the agreement to be amended. And I thought it should be now that the Wall Street Journal had the story. And I thought she should have a media consultant reporting to us. And then Michael told me that he wasn't reimbursed for Stormy Daniels. And Michael told me that he also didn't get his bonus. So he asked me to speak to Trump to help him get his bonus. And I did that. I said, Mr. Trump, I believe Michael Cohen would go in front of a bus for me. And Mr. Trump said, well, Cohen owes 50 taxi medallions. Owes or maybe owns or something. Mr. Trump said, Michael has apartments in my building. Says, I'll take care of it. Says, okay, I'll talk to him. So then I was invited to Trump Tower and there was more security than I had ever even seen. Jared Kushner saw me, took me upstairs to Mr. Trump's office or the waiting room, wherever we were. And in the waiting room, Pecker says, Keith Schiller said, hey, how's our girl? Meaning Karen McDougal. And then I was summoned in and Mike Pompeo and others were there telling him about Fort Lauderdale and the shooting that day. And Mr. Trump introduced me as the head of the National Enquirer. This big room, Mike Pompeo, who at the time, if this is 17, you know, may have been CIA director or whatever. So Mr. Trump told them, he says, he told them, I knew more than anyone in the room. It was a joke, but they didn't get it because they're so dumb. That's a funny joke. So he goes in here, all these national security people, Secretary of State, Pompeo, you know, CIA, Secretary of State, all these people all in there. And Trump says, hey, morons, this guy from the National Enquirer knows more than all of you. They don't laugh at that. <laughs> 
They're like, and the National Enquirer's like, dead right. He's like, I probably do. So they didn't get it. They left. They're like, bah, bah. Mr. Trump, they probably started to set him up with Russian collusion. And then Mr. Trump asked me, he said, hey, how's my girl? Or how's our girl? He thanked me for the doorman story. And he's, what does that mean? The doorman story, you know, for buying him. Do you think he wanted the stories for about for his family or were they for the campaign? He said, I think the campaign. He did not mention his family. So I assumed it was for the campaign. Did he mention what Melania or what Ivanka might think? No. And what happened next? Well, he invited me to the inauguration and I asked, well, how will we speak? And he said, well, he'd get a phone for friends, but it never transpired and we left it like that. Judge says, okay, this is a good time to break. And Murkan says to the lawyers, all right, come back here at 2.15 and we're back. Now the judge says before everybody's back in the courtroom, the parties are there, says, all right, I've signed the order to show cause, which presumably is for these new contempt claims saying that Trump violated the gag order again. Now, how about the text? So we're going to get into some new documents that exhibits for the jury to look at. So how about these texts? What are we doing with these? I know they're coming up. What's coming in? Well, the government says we're introducing them as business records and it was part of the regular business of AMI and they are discussions between co-conspirator Dylan Howard and Miss Rodriguez, which is insane because there's no conspiracy charge here. Mercon says, so what I'm looking through here is 15 pages of text messages. Government says, well, you don't necessarily have to do it today, judge, but we could bring them in later with a summary witness or whatever. He says, okay, I'll appreciate that. All right, bring in the witness. So we got Pecker back on the stand. Now he says, your mind are under oath, jury back in, we're ready to go. Prosecutor continues, says, all right, Mr. Pecker, let's turn now to July, 2017. Did you visit the White House? I did. Yeah, I received a call from President Trump's assistant. Her name was Madeline. I don't remember her last name. And Trump invited my wife and me for a thank you dinner to come over. Now my wife didn't want to go. President Trump told me I could bring friends and associates. It was my thank you dinner. And did you take Dylan Howard and Daniel Rothstein with you? He says, yeah, I did. And did Karen McDougal come up? Yes, she did. And President Trump asked me, how's Karen doing? I told him, she's quiet. You know, it's good. Did you and Dylan Howard take any photos together? He says, yeah. What's this photo? Jury shown a black and white photo of Dylan Howard and then one of Trump and Pecker looking like a couple of handsome gentlemen. He says, in August 2017, David, did you meet with Karen McDougal? He says, yeah, I did. At Il Postino. Sounds nice. With Dylan and Keith Davidson. Karen talked about the article that she was preparing with her ghost writers for her droop situation and Dylan had had to change them to work better with her. Oh gosh, she's high maintenance too. You're not capturing the proper shape. You have to be more articulate with your adjectives. She's screaming at her ghost writers. Oh gosh. So they get in new ghost writers who can chronicle the carnage to her breasts. Pecker says, well, my purpose was to make sure we were complying with our agreement to keep her in our family, so to speak, that she not go to speak to the press. All right, now I want to go to January 2018. Trump's still president. Did another article come out that Michael Cohen paid Stormy Daniels? Pecker says, yes. And how about now to March 2018? Did you learn that Karen McDougal was interviewed by Anderson Cooper? Yeah, another one, right, on Cooper's show. You're interesting. You're fascinating to talk to, Anderson. So she shows up. Pecker says, yeah, I watched it. You know, the next day Trump called me. Donald, he says to me, did you see it? The Stormy Daniels thing, says Pecker. Government cuts him off. I'm only asking about Karen here. I don't want to hear about Stormy. Did he ask you about Karen? He said, did you see the interview with Cooper and Karen McDougal? I thought we had an agreement. I told him, I said, Mr. President, I know I amended it. And he got aggravated. Why? Why'd you amend it? I thought we had it all figured out. He couldn't understand why. And did you speak with him and the White House staff? He says, yeah. Hope Hicks was on the call. I think she was communications. Sarah Huckabee Sanders. I said I would extend her contract. And he thought that was a bad idea, but said, it's your business. And so do what you think. Now, did Miss Dougal sue AMI back? Yeah, she wanted back her lifetime rights, right? So she's going to go get it back anyways. You can never, you know, have enough. Pecker, I told Michael Cohen, I said, I'm not going to litigate this. I'm just going to give her back the rights. Exactly right. Smart business. Here, just take them. Okay. So not only did she get the money, she gets her rights back and she gets her droopy booby story worked on by ghostwriters. Got it. Nice. And Trump's the exploiter here. Got it. So now government says, what about Stormy Daniels? Mr. Trump asks if I'd seen it. He says, yeah, did you see the Stormy Daniels? Says, you know, she's violating the agreement. This is a million dollar damages every time she uses my name. Government says, did you receive a letter from the FEC and call Michael Cohen when you got the letter? He says, yeah, I did. I told Michael, I'm worried. So I got this letter from the FEC, man. I'm nervous. He said, why? He said, Jeff Sessions is the attorney general and Donald Trump has him in his back pocket from Michael Cohen, right? Talking a big game. Now, did you enter a non-prosecution agreement, Mr. Pecker, with the Southern District of New York, the feds who investigated this? 
this? Yes. And did the agreement objection from Trump, judge overruled, government says, is this the agreement? He says, yes. And in this agreement, there's a bunch of language in here. It refers to the candidate. You see that? He says, yes. And who is the candidate in this non-prosecution agreement, which is basically like a plea deal. We won't prosecute you if you agree to these things. Who is the candidate, right? They just wanted him to sign this. He says, Mr. Trump. And he reads from the non-prosecution agreement, blah, blah, blah. And who was the model in this non-prosecution agreement? Karen McDougal. And he continues to read. It says, AMI has also agreed to implement several improvements to ensure compliance. Now, did you sign a cooperation agreement with my office here in Manhattan, the district attorneys of New York? Pecker says, yeah. He reads from that agreement too. And were you given immunity at the grand jury? He says, I was. And did AMI reach a conciliation agreement with the FEC? He says, yes, I did. It was after I left the company, but they paid a fine of $180,000, which is how most of these things are rectified, like Hillary Clinton's problem when she used her lawyers to create fake PP research against Donald Trump. And nobody went to jail for that one. Prosecution says, did you learn of FBI searches of Michael Cohen's home, David? He says, yeah, they came from my home too. And I learned of the search of Michael Cohen's apartment. Mr. Pecker, when was the last time you spoke with Trump? 2019. Did Trump ever reach out to you? Not directly. Friends would go to Mar-a-Lago and Trump would send his regards. Now, do you have a bad feeling towards him? He says, no, no, I don't. Let me give you an example. He says, after 9-11, anthrax was sent to our offices in Boca Raton and an employee died. I was down and the first person who called me was Donald Trump. He introduced me to insurers. He says, thank you, Mr. Pecker. No further questions. Cuts him off, right? Do you have any ill will towards Trump? No, actually, he's the only person who ever did anything useful for me. Thank you for that. I was down in the count. He called me. He was there. He introduced me to insurers. He says, shut up. No further questions. Your witness. Defense attorney Emil Bove stands up for cross-examination. He says, may we approach your honor? They go to the judge's bench. There's a whispered sidebar. Goes back. All right, Mr. Pecker, hello. Trump's defense says, now, sir, you were an executive at AMI from 1999 to 2020, right? Yes. You had a board and you had investors, correct? Yes. And you had a duty to make money for investors and you engaged in what some people might call checkbook journalism. Is that right? Yes. And you only published about half the stories that you bought. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds about right. About half, give or take. Can you give me some examples of why you wouldn't publish a story? Mr. Pecker says, well, we'd vet the story. We'd see if there was an interest in the story. We might trade it for another story. So, okay. So you might buy a story to gain leverage over a celebrity to give an interview, for example, or their likeness. Hey, we won't publish this, but come over and say hello. Is that right? Yeah. Now from 2015 to 2017, Dylan Howard was working for you, right? Yeah. And he was the chief content officer. Yes. And Daniel Rothstein, he had the company call up people's exhibit, the invoice, and he used him to take care of large sensitive payments. Is that right? Rothstein handles the money. Yes. Now, what was the circulation of the National Enquirer back then? Well, we had a good number, about 350,000 readers and about 70% of your sales came from newsstands. Yeah. And you had researchers and a model to maximize your profit. Is that true? Yeah. And a president was the top selling celebrity, wasn't he? Yes. And so you had the launch of George Magazine, in fact, at Mar-a-Lago, didn't you? Yes. And there was a Trump style magazine. And for a long time then, you had a strategy of not publishing negative stories about President Trump because you also had a Trump style magazine, like the an actual magazine. So you don't want to bash your own brands, correct? You had a long strategy. And this goes all the way back to 1998. You let President Trump know about a negative story about Marla Maples, didn't you? I did. And you didn't stop it, but you tried to, right? Right. And you ran positive stories about Trump, didn't you? Yeah. And those stories made money. Yeah. Now, before this case ever occurred, you've been in this industry for a long time. Oh yeah. Before we got here, you'd never heard the phrase catch and kill. Is that right? He says, right. I never heard of it. <laughs> they just made it up. He says, so it was the prosecutors who taught you that phrase, right? Yes, they taught me. And you have similar relationships with other politicians too, don't you? For example, you did this for Ron Perlman of Revlon too. You stopped a story against an opening of Planet Hollywood in which he owned a stake. Is that true? Yes, I did. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, you needed his blessing and you reached an agreement for him. Is that right? He was given an equity stake and positions in the company. And then women come out of the woodwork, right? There were 30 or 40 of them or something. He says, yeah, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to purchase stories for Arnold Schwarzenegger, another politician who's not sitting in 
Bragg's courtroom right now. You sent Gigi Goyette to Hawaii, didn't you? Pecker says, yeah, we did. And you also purchased a story concerning Tiger Woods, right? He says, yeah, a source agreement. And you purchased photos of a woman meeting with Tiger Woods with a parking lot in Florida. And you used them to force him to appear on the cover of Man's Fitness. Okay, so they say, Tiger, my man, we got some photos of you with another one. He's like, oh, yeah. we'll hold it if you come show up. He did. So you've suppressed negative stories for Ari Emanuel, right? He says, yeah, him or one of his celebrities. He says, who? You know, Mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg apparently had an argument with his wife. The story was going to come out and I told him where to go buy the rights. And you did it for Rahm Emanuel. Oh, who worked in the Obama White House. Didn't you buy stories for him? Yes. This story was about an affair, right? After Rahm Emanuel left the White House. Now you did this while pursuing a business venture in Chicago, didn't you? Yeah, I did. The Wasserstein Perella. So Biden's chief of staff, I believe was Obama's, and he's a politician who also went to run in Chicago and was buying stories. But he's not sitting in Alvin Bragg's courtroom, is he? Trump's defense says, Mr. Pecker, you also told the grand jury a meeting with Mr. Trump took place in August, but then you changed to mid-August, right? You said early to mid. He says, you know, I don't recall. You were under oath at the grand jury, right? Yeah. But now you've changed it. Objection. He says, sustained. He says, you know, it's hard to remember, right? Probably argumentative. It's hard to remember things, isn't it? Yes. Your mind fills in the gaps, correct? He says, yes. And how many meetings with prosecutors have you had this year, Mr. Pecker? He says, oh gosh, four, maybe five. And you met with federal prosecutors too, didn't you? Yeah. How many times? Five or six times. And then you met with Bragg's DA office, right? And they practice with you. Uh, not a script, but you knew what was coming, right? Yes. And Michael Cohen, he asked you for help that had nothing to do with President Trump, didn't he? All the time. He says, yeah. For example, he asked you to help his daughter's rock climbing company, didn't he? Yes. And Cohen told you that he was not working for the campaign at all. Is that true? Yes. And the FBI soon came to your house. You were subject to an FEC inquiry and it was important for you to get everything out, right? Yes. But you didn't tell anyone that Hope Hicks participated in the meeting before, did you? Objection. Please approach. Sustained. Trump's defense says, okay, before that little break there, when asked, you did not mention Hope Hicks before, right? Can I see what you're referring to? He says, I'll bring it up, but only for Mr. Pecker and the parties here. He says, all right, this is a report on the meeting that we're talking about. Now, you did not tell the government that Hope Hicks was there in the Trump Tower meeting before. So I don't know what page you're referring to. He says, well, that's why I gave you the document. It says on August 2nd, you met again with the prosecutors about the August 2015 meeting. He says, I need to see the report. He says, you need to see the report to remember this? He says, yes. Now, at no point did you mention Hope Hicks, objection. And you also testified to the grand jury, objection, may we approach, sidebar. They're talking up at the judge's bench, bench, whispers in the air. Judge says, all right, jurors, we're gonna go ahead and break there, all right? You're relieved for the day. Thank you for being here. Don't read about the case, see you tomorrow. Jury exits. Government comes back. Says, your honor, to show the witness A-102, which has nothing about the August meeting, says Mr. Pecker wasn't even given an opportunity. There's no indication he was asked or that it would be a notable admission. And so it was improper impeachment from the defense. He says, your honor, he asked me for the document. He said, he didn't ask for A-102. He said, well, I don't know what's behind the redactions, so I can't see. So I don't know what you're talking, they're fighting over this document. Judge says, sit down, both of you. I'm going to instruct the jury about it tomorrow. Says, you should be careful about this so this redaction crap doesn't happen again. Says, tomorrow, government says, we're going to apply tomorrow to subpoena the Trump organization. They are available. And he says, tomorrow, late morning, see you at 9.30, adjourn. And boom, another day, trial, day seven in the house. And after trial was done for the day, Donald Trump came out and he shared his take on what he says was shocking testimony that we just heard. Thank you very much, everybody. Today was uh, breathtaking in this room. You saw what went on. It was breathtaking and amazing testimony. This is a trial that should have never happened. This is a case that should have never been filed. And it was really an incredible day. Open your eyes and we can't let this continue to happen to our country. On another matter, you know, uh, the economy has just been reported to be doing very badly. The stock market's way down and some horrible numbers came out, including very high numbers on inflation and a particular gasoline at seven and a half dollars in California. That usually leads the way. It's going to happen here too. And very importantly, as you look at the various colleges all over the country and beyond colleges because it's happening in other areas too. You see what's happening on the front having to do with Palestine and Israel and protests and hate, anger. Biden is sending an absolutely horrible message. 
message. Horrible, horrible message. He has no idea how to message. He can't speak. He can't put two sentences together. He doesn't know what to do. This is not our president. This is somebody that shouldn't be doing what he's doing because he can't do it. He can't do it well. We're having protests all over. He was talking about Charlottesville. Charlottesville was a little peanut and it was nothing compared and the hate wasn't the kind of hate that you have here. This is tremendous hate and we have a man that can't talk about it because he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand what's going on with our country. He doesn't understand that all over the world we're being laughed at as a country because of him and his administration. And today we had a year because I was forced to be here and I'm glad I was because it was a very interesting day in a certain way. But the U.S. Supreme Court had a monumental hearing on immunity and the immunity having to do with uh, presidential immunity. And I think it was made clear, I hope it was made clear that a president has to have immunity or you don't have a president. Or at most you can say it would be a ceremonial president. That's not what the founders had in mind. They're not well, talking about a ceremonial DOJ, one president that can get things done and bring people together. So I heard the meeting was quite amazing and the justices were on their game. Let's see how that all turns out. But again, I say presidential immunity, very powerful presidential immunity is imperative or you practically won't have a country anymore. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. President, thank you for that. So a full day, day seven, and we are going to be back here on day eight to wrap up the week two of trial. And so we're grateful to have you join us. I think today was an interesting day of testimony, but what I take away is that a lot of this was just regular business that a lot of other people have been involved in, including Arnold Schwarzenegger, including Rahm Emanuel, including many other people who are not sitting in courtrooms because their ledger used a wrong legal phrase or something like that. And Alvin Bragg clearly targeting Trump. More evidence of that comes out from their own witnesses. And we'll pick back up with David Pecker on day eight, and we'll hopefully see you back here. Thank you for subscribing and liking this video. Thanks for inviting someone you know or love to come over to our channel. Check it out. Come join us for a live stream so they can see what's going on here. We have a great members only community as well. We'd love to have you join us there. We do live streams in the morning. So we talk about a bunch of other stuff that we can't get in on this show. And we also do streams on Saturday. We have an amazing community. So come check it out. Watching the watchers.locals.com. We'd love to see you over there and back here on the next one. Oh,